And so that's what this book was meant to do is kind of, um, as opposed to just being an instruction manual for one tool, talk about how to combine different tools. And then you can go find the instruction manual for the tools that you actually choose to put into the life cycle for data flows and such. If you go online and just search for like how to learn data engineering stuff or, or some equivalent search, right? There's still a lot of, there's still a lot of like mind boggling uh, diagrams and, and tips out there. Like you got to learn uh, Hadoop and Pig and, uh, you know, all these, um, you know, fairly ancient, uh, you know, platforms and technology. I guess since we only have six people here, we can like introduce ourselves and get to know each other, kind of. Um, my name is Sophia. I am a data scientist at Anaconda. I have been wanting to get into a data science book club, and I couldn't find one. That's why I was like, why don't I just do it by myself? And so I started this book club on Discord. And also, like, I'm a super introvert. I don't like doing meetups for book clubs in person so I thought like asynchronously makes a lot of sense uh that's why I did that and the first book we chose is your guys fundamentals of data engineering let's see <laughs> I have the physical awesome. book nice. uh, yeah I love this new book love it so much I feel like it's essential for data scientists to know data engineering and this is a golden bible for me I feel like Cool. Awesome. Well, that was the uh, part of the intention of it. Uh, definitely the audience was a data scientist, data analyst and so forth. So I'm glad you, glad you like it. So Nice. Do you guys want to introduce we'll yourselves and we can get started? Yeah. <laughs> sure. So yeah, I'm uh, I'm Matt Housley. So I'm co-founder of Ternary Data with uh, Joe Reese and also co-author of Fundamentals of Data Engineering. And uh, we both jokingly refer to ourselves as recovering data scientists. <laughs> And that's actually not intended to disparage data science. It's more to say that we we both had this experience, and I think many other data engineers have too, of being hired into data science positions and then like not being able to get the data that we needed or the data quality that we needed or the systems or automation that we needed. And so we kind of ended up in data engineering roles for that reason. And so that's part of why this book is kind of data science flavored. In other words, it talks about a lot of different consumers of data and use cases for data. But a big emphasis is data science because that's why we got into data engineering is to like feed ML and data science processes. And I'll, Joe, go go for it. Uh, yeah, I'm Joe. Uh, what Matt said, basically. So, um, <laughs> also co-founder of Ternary Data and co-author of uh, Fundamentals of Data Engineering. So, uh, yeah, I would say my, my experience echoes a lot of um, you know what what Matt said. And that was a lot of the motivation for writing the book. Um, Nice, thank you. Um, I'll go by order here. Quan, would you like to introduce yourself? <laughs> hey, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm Quan, Quan Ho, Stephen Ho. Uh, I'm a data scientist at Lidos. I, I, I didn't write any books. Uh, yeah. Not yet. <laughs> yeah, so nice to meet you all. Nice. Nice, Daniel? Okay, let me uh, introduce myself as well. My name is Daniel. I'm from uh, Brazil. I have been working for uh, quite some time, but uh, I've recently uh, moved to uh, another team, a, a data engineering team. So uh, in the last year and a half, uh, I've been reading a lot about uh, data engineering and I've read several books. M most of the books uh, Joe and, and Matt <laughs> listed uh, as uh, additional, uh, I have already read. read so oh, cool. yeah, it, it was great that, that you guys wrote that book because, I mean, it's the book that I wish I had like one year and a half ago when, when mm. we started uh, learning. So, uh -huh. yeah, thank yeah. you guys. <laughs> well, better, better late than never. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. It's really nice to meet you guys. Yeah, good to person. meet you too. Yeah, I've seen you online sure. a lot, so it's good to uh, finally talk. So, I think we'll just like feel free to ask questions as we go on, or you can like type in your question if you don't want to talk. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess I can get started. I'm just curious, what is the story behind this book? Like what do you, what motivates you to write this book? 
God, that's a, that's a good question. I ask myself that every day still. Um, <laughs> so I think, you know, a lot of it really came from, uh, um, we kept seeing a lot of books out there and I think they're, they're, they're good for what they, what they want to accomplish, right? It's books like, you know, data engineering on AWS or data engineering with, with Python. Um, you know, I think these are good tactical books for teaching, you know, data engineering techniques on a platform or a technology. But there was a big divide, I think, between those types of books and, um, you know, canonical books like data, design data intensive applications, which I think is still one of the gold standards for data engineering books. But you talk to anybody who, who reads that book and, and they kind of fall into two categories. It's like you either are ready to read that book. Um, and I would say a much larger number of people, uh, you know, try to read that book. And it's, it's, it's just a, it's a tough read. It, it definitely, you know, uh, throws you into the, the deep waters pretty quick. And so we felt like there's, you know, a, a prequel to designing data and intensive applications was um, needed in the world. And, and by that, I mean, like, you know, what, the challenge really is, how do you write a book that's, uh, you know, in a field that's moving fast? Um, you know, how do you write a book that's not going to change that quickly, you know, over the next five, 10 years? And so that was really the, the motivation behind writing. And I would say that, you know, the intellectual challenge of writing, it was really trying to decipher, like, what's somewhat immutable um, versus, you know, what's very, um, you know, fleeting and, and transitory. And that was, that was a big motivation. It was kind of funny when we talked to O'Reilly about the idea, you know, our, our acquisitions editor, Jess Haberman, who now works at Anaconda, actually, you know, she, she said point blank, she said, you guys are crazy. Like, you know, it's your first book. Like, why do you want to do this? Um, and uh, I thought about it for a bit. And I guess, you know, it just made a lot of sense to, to do this. I guess, you know, if you're going to, it's kind of a go, go big or go home moment. Like, you know, if you want to write, it's not an easy book. I would say everyone we talked to said this would be kind of like, you know, a difficulty of like nine out of 10 or 10 out of 10 to write. It's not, it's not an easy book, but we, I think, um, well, I guess we're kind of dumb or something or just really stubborn. We're just like, yeah, we'll, we'll do it. So, so we did it. I don't know, Matt, what, 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 what did you have a personal motivation behind writing this? Um, no, I mean, I think it goes along with the journey that we both kind of had going from data science to data engineering. And I, I think part of what this book was meant to accomplish is just to share the things that we went through in some sense to make those useful for other people. Um, th there's a second kind of chronological story behind this book. And that is, if we look back the last 20 years of data engineering, the field has evolved so much and it had, it had evolved to the point where a new book was needed. So let's think about it like way back in the day, if you were working for Google, like early 2000s, you were figuring out like the fundamentals of how to build distributed systems, like just from the ground up. And then after that, uh, a few years later, you know, Hadoop came out. So then other people were building this open source software, but you still had to manage this really complex open source software. And I think for most data engineers now, the goal is more to use tools that already exist, right? Like sometimes you need to go in and build a custom solution. And especially if you work for Google or Facebook, you might still be doing that kind of work. But I think most of us are more focused on like taking a lot of different tools and figuring out how to pick the right ones and use them to actually build a practical solution. And so that's what this book was meant to do is kind of, um, as opposed to just being a, an instruction manual for one tool, talk about how to combine different tools. And then you can go find the instruction manual for the tools that you actually choose to put into the life cycle for data flows and such. But yeah, it just felt like chronologically it was the right time for this, right? Like things, even within the last five years, the, the evolution has happened pretty fast. Even say in 2016, Hadoop was kind of a big thing. And now it's, it's kind of on life support at this point. And so our book just kind of traces that evolution. Well, yeah, and I would say too, there, there were, you know, if, if you look at the, if you go online and just search for like how to learn data engineering stuff or, or some equivalent search, right? There's still a lot of, there's still a lot of like mind boggling uh, diagrams and, and tips out there. Like you got to learn uh, Hadoop and Pig and, uh, you know, all these, um, you know, fairly ancient, uh, you know, platforms and technology. I'll just say that the Hadoop ecosystem isn't so widely embedded in the Apache ecosystem, for example. But, you know, it's, I would say that to, to know these things is, it's sort of like learning Latin. Um, like, I guess you could do that, but why? So. Yeah, I, do, I really appreciate that because as a data scientist or a user, I don't really dig into Hadoop and stuff to mess around with the data engineering tools, but I do want to understand the fundamentals, the theoretical parts of it. So this book really gives me that, that 
more understanding towards what exactly are different tools doing and why we're doing certain things a certain way. Yeah, mm -hmm. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Cool. Yeah, of course. <laughs> um, anyone else have questions? I know. Uh, I was just saying that uh, I follow that uh, awesome data engineering website. <laughs> but, uh, I feel the same thing that, that Joe said. Everybody has a, a medium article saying, okay, to be a data engineer, you have to follow these things or, yes. or study uh, that kind of thing. And a challenge that I have as a, a software development or a data engineering manager now is uh, how do I uh, train my people? I mean, it's very difficult to hire uh, data engineers uh, on the market, like ready. So more like we have to, to have some kind of training, some kind of uh, onboarding and without uh, your book, it would be a lot more challenging. Like you mentioned like Martin Kleppman's uh, book. I mean, I can give that to, to an intern to, to read, you know, so yeah. It's a hard one. Yeah, yeah like yeah. And I've seen that happen. I've seen people like hand off uh, Martin's book to people that they're just, I mean, that's a bad idea. I think for people starting out, it's a great idea the person has experience, but I mean, I think I've read that book what, three times now. Um, part of it was well, part of the was for research of our book. Um, and Martin was what, actually one of our reviewers for our book too. He's one of our tech reviewers. And so, you know, we got his perspective on stuff and he's just, he just approaches things much differently, right? But to train teams, you know, I think to your point, it's like, we're seeing a lot of feedback on this actually. Like I, I think I counted, um, you know, call it like a hundred companies or something like that with their data teams are using our book as a, as a reference now, which I thought was pretty astounding because the book's fairly new. Right. And, but I, I think it's hitting exactly what you were talking about, Daniel, where um, there, you know, it's something Matt and I've been thinking about too, like the, the standards data engineering knowledge isn't really standardized or um, uh, you know, spread across teams in a uniform way. And so it, what I find really interesting is when, when you're trying to hire a data engineer, like, what do you, how do you hire a data engineer and know they're any good? Right. Um, it, it's sort of like uh, trying to put together a sports team, you know, maybe a, a, a football team and, you know, and, um, you know, non American football. Right. I mean, just because you can go kick a ball, you know, you know which people can like run and kick a ball doesn't mean you're going to have a good team. But that's how we put together uh, data teams right now. And I find it's, it's pretty odd. Like there's no, um, again, there's no standardization, no standard competencies, no standard body of knowledge. And, and one of the goals that we're finding with the book that people have is just, standardizing that knowledge. I was talking to somebody yesterday about this. They, they're in Los Angeles and they're, they're using our book for the team. And um, so, you know, we're shameless plug. We are, we are working on uh, workshops and trainings for, for corporations for data engineering. So if, if anyone has a need for that, uh, hit us up. But yeah, what, what you're experiencing, Daniel, I think is very, we didn't realize it would be this common, but it, I think this is like kind of the default use of the book is what we're finding. So and uh, the other comment I'll make, Martin's book is awesome, but I, I think it has two main use cases for data engineers. So one use case is that you're working at a big thing company and you're working on core infrastructure, right? So if I work at Google and I'm working on like Colossus, which is their huge storage system, which has replaced math, you know, the Google file system, then I need to know everything about distributed systems. I think most modern data engineers actually more need Martin's book for debugging. In other words, when they're using a system like Spark or BigQuery or Snowflake, they need to understand some things about distributed systems that are going on behind the scenes as they're optimizing those tools. And for that, you need to understand principles of columnar data warehouses or data systems and principles of distributed systems and latency and consistency and all these things. But most of us anymore are not like in the guts, you know, writing code for managing node communication or something like that. That's just that it's like any field of engineering, right? Like way back in the day as an aircraft engineer, maybe you were working on like one tiny electrical system or something. And now you're probably just getting off the shelf components and assembling them into an aircraft. And that's, that's kind of where we're at in this field. And you really do need to have a bigger vision, but also know a lot about a lot of things. And so it is very challenging. What I found really interesting is one of our um, friends, uh, John King, so he was the first or the, uh, well, the fourth um, production install of Hadoop in the world. So like super early user of Hadoop. And he, he so he's, and he works at Imply, which is a company behind Druid. And he, so he's like the data engineer's data engineer. Like anyone who works at Imply is like, this guy's, you know, probably, uh, you know, he's got among the most cloud of anybody that company. If you look at who's, who works there too, it's like, it's hitters, like people who are really good at data. And engineering and even he said what he wrote he read the book he's like oh, man there's like a lot that you need to know it's crazy like, you know it, you didn't realize how much the field had evolved 
um, since then. So I think that was a big, um, a big tell, I, I think for Matt and I, when we, when we got the feedback from John about that, cause it, it was like, okay, so you're, you're, you know, on top of your game still as a data engineer. And I would consider him one of the best, you know, I've ever met. And even he said it was intimidating. He was like, you, you're going to, you know, are you really going to release this book to the public? There's so much that you need to know. You're going to scare people away. And I, and I was funny too. It was actually uh, when I um, was uh, um, hanging out with Bill Inman and uh, he, the first, I handed him the book. And the first thing he did is he, he said, this book needs to be half this size. Next time you write a book, don't go above 200 pages. <laughs> But, um, you know, but, too late but, now. We talk too much. Yeah, sorry. Oops. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, but I think the whole point is, you know, there's just. I mean, and the thing is, there's a lot that we left out. So, uh, you know, there's that shows. I mean, we tried to consolidate everything into a you know a pretty streamlined way, but this is still, this is the introductory text. This doesn't even get into like the, the medium to. Well, I think it's 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 I think it's beginner to, to intermediate, but you know the advanced topics. I mean, that's. Martin Kleppman's book does that, but I think that there's there's still a, a large body of knowledge that neither book talks about that data engineers, you know, at some point will need to know. So, when is our next book? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, um, actually, I am working on one right now on data modeling. Oh wow! So, mm -hmm. When's uh, that coming just, out? <laughs> I think we're going to have a mini guide, a, a mini book, probably uh, sometime this fall. Um, in all reality. So yeah, stay tuned for that. But the, the bigger one, um, yeah, I kind of let myself a bit, a bit, get a bit carried away with it. So it, it's gonna, it might be a bit, <laughs> so it's, uh, it's a new way of data modeling that I'm working on right now. So looking uh, forward to it. Thanks. Yeah. You'll, well, you'll, <laughs> <laughs> I think I'll be, a, I think it'll be a really old by the time it's done, but yeah, we'll see. <laughs> So <laughs> I think Joe and I are both a little more gray after writing this book. So we'll yeah. try to pace ourselves. This time. Well, so I was in the, I was in the, uh, the uh, New York Metropolitan Museum of Art the other day. And it was funny. There's this painting that um, this guy had started back when he started being an artist and he'd worked on it for, I think like 50 years and never finished it. So it was a scene of like a sunset in a forest and it was huge. And like, he never finished the painting like and his friends urged him to do it but his friends tried to finish it for him but it just never got done and i feel like that's like some books like they just they just ne they're never done um i think that's like all books frankly like there's a lot of things i'd probably change in this one to be frank sure um, you know but so in your you writing out. process how did you motivate yourself to write each chapter and get it done in time i assume there's a timeline a schedule yeah there's a contractual timeline so so um, how this works is uh, I'll, I'll give you kind of the background of how it works when you get a publisher like O'Reilly. So, cause if anyone wants to write a book, this is kind of what you got to do. So you, you do the book proposal, it takes a good few weeks to get that done. It's a hard process. Like not every book gets accepted. I think O'Reilly might accept maybe 10, 12 books this year, maybe. Um, I'm sure everyone wants to write for them. And so that's kind of how that goes. But once you get your book proposal accepted, um, you know, your book proposal is your contract to write your book. So it has a, the table of contents, which is roughly the outline of what you're going to write about. Um, there's a deadline. Um, there's certain milestones you got to hit. So the first two chapters are due by a certain date. Half the book is due by another date. Um, the first full manuscript is due by probably a year, which is what we set it out. And then the final draft is due. Um, you know, it's less than a year, actually, for the uh, final uh, manuscript. But then final manuscript and then final um, draft, which are not the same things. Let's do a bit after. And then you go through what's called quality control edits. You go through about a couple of those and um, they do copy editing and that's pretty insane. I don't know how they do that. It's, we got copy editing was like, they looked at our book and within a few days they had like, everything was redlined um, and edited. It was like, the most crazy thing I've ever seen. They were like, so fast. It was so absolutely fast. insane. Yeah, yeah, they must have had some automation shocked. or something because it was like, this yeah. is nuts. Um, yeah. So I think that the process really, so once, so that's the kind of the structural process of working with a publisher, but then you have what's called a development editor that um, you're assigned and they uh, work with you. They're sort of your project manager in a lot of ways. Um, so they just want to make sure the book's on track. They make sure that the flow of the book's good. Um, you also get technical reviewers along the way. So people who can, um, you know, uh, look at the technical aspects of your book and make sure it's, um, you know, makes sense and is aligned with reality. So uh, we had a huge staple of tech reviewers. Um, I would say get more, probably double the number you think you're going to need because people will drop out uh, along the way. It's just kind of how it is. It's like the Oregon Trail. Um, so just, 
know, new, new people come in, some people leave and that's how it is. So the process really is like, um, I think we worked on it chapter by chapter, really. It, it was, and we worked on it very sequentially because we felt like everything kind of had to build on itself. Um, and it was, because the notion of the book is a life cycle. And so it really does need to be a sequential um, thought process. Um, and so, you know, my, my writing style is completely different than Matt's. So this is like the thing when you have a co-author, you got to realize like your, how you write and how you think is not going to be the same as the other person. And like, so I think, you know, we, we tried doing like project management boards and everything to keep on track. But at the end of the day, it's just, um, you know, I, I set out usually, you know, I'm a big fan of jotting things on paper. So I, I would jot out like, you know, Monday, I'm getting this part done Tuesday, Wednesday and so forth, you know, and then you just, um, for me, I write a certain number of words a day and just try and do what's called a, a zero draft as well. And that's like, it doesn't matter if it sucks or not, just get the idea like on the document because your words are what matter. Like output of words is when you're writing a book is like the only thing that matters at this and quality of ideas for sure. That's sort of table stakes, but like you have to, you have to write. That's, that's how a book gets done. And it's, it's the simplest thing to say and it's the hardest thing to do. Uh, Matt, you want to talk about how you write though? Because I think you have a much different style than I do. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely outline things, but um, <clears throat> often as you're writing, you come up with more ideas, which kind of goes along with what Joe was saying, right? Like that's that's just kind of the output of ideas. Like you come up with your initial ideas and then you start writing and then you kind of see where your ideas take you from there and then maybe go back to the drawing board and re-outline a bit. Um, we also even found this at the level of the book proposal, right? So we had proposed certain chapters and then we found that some of them were like very, very difficult or needed to be reorganized. And so we ended up dedicating a lot of ink, for example, to architecture. And that chapter changed a lot. And we had to kind of rethink that a few times as we were writing and reiterating. That was the hardest chapter to write. It was hard. Yeah. So you want to talk, you, okay, so I'm going to give you a, um, some homework to do. So you go talk to somebody who has the, the uh, word architect in their title. And go and ask them what is architecture. Simple question. Um, you'll get you'll probably get a really dumbfounded look. Um, so it, it was hard, and I would say like you know um, to follow on what Matt was saying. Um, like I know I spent like probably 80, 90 percent of my time reading and researching like that. You know, so that gives you an idea of the amount of writing that was involved. If like you're spending most of your time researching and reading, like and architecture was particularly hard. Um, it's a squishy yeah. topic, right? So chapter three, like. That's by far the hardest chapter to write in the book. That's that was scary because um, we knew it would be polarizing as well. Because the moment you start talking about architecture, everybody has an idea about what that is and how it should be done. So, um. and it's also a domain that's shifted a lot, right? Like one of the big changes that we've seen in the evolution of architecture. Well, there's also like a, a cultural difference across different types of organizations, but in the very traditional old school enterprise. An architect is something very, very specific. It's kind of like this command and control job of people who are going to choose what te which technologies to buy and such. Whereas in more modern companies, it's like this much more fluid idea of dynamically making decisions about software and data systems and such. And so part of what we had to do is converge some of these definitions. And so like we use a lot of the old school resources like uh, Dama, Diembach, which is this like... <laughs> huge tome on data management, but that it, it's just utterly mass, but it was written by a committee. We borrowed from that, but we also took a lot of ideas from like other current consultants and people write on medium and all kinds of different places. So, mm -hmm. but yeah, that was tough. And then I would say the the section on choosing the right technologies was also that chapter was also pretty challenging, Joe. <laughs> yeah, it was hard. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cause everyone has an opinion on that too. So and I'm trying, I'm just looking at the book right now to see uh, what else is, you know, it's well, kind of funny. Weird. Like, I, I, I forgot when I, it was funny during the, uh, the, the final um, review process, uh, like it was weird writing the book. Cause I'm like, who wrote this? Yeah. Yeah. Well, cause we co-wrote it. We edited each other stuff. So yeah, often, but it's like, it's, it's, kind pretty, of a it's, it's good. Yeah. But I'm just like, I don't, I don't believe that we wrote this thing. This is like kind of crazy. So, <laughs> yeah. so the book is centered around this in data engineering life cycle and the like, current, right? Like, how did you come up with this? life cycle and on occurrence like did you have that idea before you wrote this book kind, oh, kind of yeah. so what i would say is that we um we took inspiration for various places and so like i think google cloud platform actually had a couple of blog posts about how you should think about data flowing through a life cycle like this and their goal in doing this was actually kind of similar to ours their process like okay you have all these technologies on our platform 
here are the different stages. Here's how you might use these technologies. And then we took inspiration from other places too, but we kind of synthesize, synthesize those ideas to distill them into something that kind of belonged to us and hopefully was a little more refined. And then uh, you want to talk about the undercurrents, Joe? Yeah, I mean, the undercurrents are interesting because, you know, when you talk about things like security or data governance or data management, like where does that fit in, right? So you could, so we initially thought we'd write like, um, and we did in some cases write separate chapters where they yeah. be, need to be explicitly called out, but like um, something like uh, security, that, that should really just be along every part of the life cycle. It's not like you only do security when you're storing data, right? Or transforming it, that'd be like absolute lunacy. Um, like security has to be everywhere. Um, and so that was, you know, the undercurrents is kind of what we came up with. It were just undercuts like every aspect of the life cycle. And what I find interesting about the life cycle is actually listening to the data engineering podcast this morning when I was out for a jog and um, somebody's talking about data automation and, um, you know, and, and actually, instead of thinking about data, data movement from left to right, you know, they, they actually thought about it from right to left. So that was really fascinating. Um, you know, and I, I think that, but the cool thing with the life cycle is it's not really, um, um, things can meander around too. It's, it's not like it's a, it's one direction that things go, right? And so um, things can recurse themselves or, or in fact, move backwards. And so, but, I, you know, so, but it was a convenient way, I think of like, at least coming up with a way of thinking about how data moves and flows and, um, you know, and how to think about architecture and technologies on top of that. Um, but yeah, it wasn't obvious. And when you, when you Google uh, data life cycle, I mean, there's like a bajillion images on different life cycles. It's, um, you know, there's no, I mean, it's, it's an old concept. It's not like data life cycle is a new thing. It's been around for ages. Um, I remember seeing these back in the, the 2000s, even the early 2000s, like data, data life cycle. And it's like, um, you know, so people have been thinking about this stuff for a long time, but I don't think anyone, uh, I've no, I didn't see really anyone talking about it from a data engineering perspective. And, but it really was the sort of the cornerstone of, of the book. So, yeah, I do data, data, data life cycle management. What are you going to say? Oh, I was just saying, I do like that you wrote um, about the art of undercurrent seeing each stage of the life cycle, I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, I have another question. So there are like so many data new terms coming out, like data mesh, data niche, you know that. Like why do those terms just become so popular all of a sudden? Like, where are they from? Like why people are talking about it? I mean, so, it's interesting. Oh, go on, go ahead, Jeff. I was, I was just going to say some of these terms are old and they've come back in vogue. So for example, data management, I mean, how long has that term been around, term been around Joe, right. 70s or 80s, like maybe? Since like the 30s or something like that. <laughs> maybe. So I, I think that particular one, um, what happened is during the era of like, you know, peak data, like peak Hadoop, everyone kind of ignored data management. And so that term wasn't in the air. And then at some point they realized, oh, I have a data swamp. I need data management. And so it kind of like came back into vogue. Um, other terms, I feel like I'd be curious to know who first used the term data observability, but that's kind of maybe a somewhat old idea that's been evolved a bit and has just become extremely popular because again, it's something people have finally realized like, hey, I have to manage data quality, data processes. How do I combine all those ideas into one? I would say like, if you, if you look at software engineering, like that pretty much provides a template for any term that you see in data right now, whether it's observability. Um, data mesh, actually, that's basically just um, uh, microservices repurposed for data, right? I mean, that's literally all it is. It's the same concept of domain and product. Uh, and if you if you actually look back at um, software architecture literature, um, especially from the ThoughtWorks people like Neil Ford and Martin Fowler and, and actually Zamok herself who came up with data mesh, um, you know, it, it's no surprise that data mesh came out of ThoughtWorks because they're like one of the leading people that think about uh, you know, software architecture topologies and microservices and, you know, kind of distributed, um, you know, domain ownership and stuff. And so it's, it, you know, it was simply a mental leap of like, okay, so how does that work in data? So if you take what, what software engineers are doing and you say, how does that apply to data? You pretty much can come up with like crazy cool new terms that are just repackaging of old stuff. And then you can claim that it's new and, you know, get a bunch of VC money and start a business around it. So that's, that's, we've seen that happen a ton. I mean, I think, uh, uh, reverse ETL is the other one, like that's in the book. And I think that's maybe one of the areas where I, I'm, I'm glad we put it in there. I'm, I'm kind of disappointed because reverse ETL is a, is a very polarizing term. Uh, people either really like it or they really hate it. Um, 
uh, data mesh is the same way, I guess, but, uh, you know, we, we definitely call out uh, reverse ETL in, in, I think, chapter nine or something like that, where it's one of the ways of serving data. And it is, but that's not a new idea. Like if you've worked in data engineering for any length of time, like you've probably done something like that, where you're sending data back into a, a source system. I mean, I think almost everyone's done that, but it wasn't really called that until, um, you know, a reverse ETL company decided to call it that. I mean, I, I actually came up with a term called a BLT. So a uh, uh, bi-directional load transform. So, which I think is uh, both an awesome sandwich and probably more accurately describes what you're doing with uh, that phenomenon, but um, it didn't catch on, unfortunately. Yeah, no, that yeah. was- Keep fighting the good fight. Yeah, cause I want my BLT, so yeah. But, it, but I think to answer your question, you know, these terms, um, I mean, it's interesting. If you, if you look back to uh, even terms like data warehousing, right? Like data warehouse um, that came out in 1989 uh, when Bill and Min wrote, um, you know, the, um, the data warehouse, uh, um, building the data warehouse was the book, right? And so, but back then it meant something completely different, right? It was, um, you know, I think it was subject oriented, time variant, um, you know, um, you know, collection of data. And I think there's another piece of that where, you know, it, but meant to support management decision-making. And that was not, but it, so and if, you, if you look at the architecture he described, it's, it's much different than what you see today where data warehousing is, uh, well, now it's a product, right? And there's data warehouse companies and stuff, but that wasn't always the case. Like when, when Bill came up with the idea, it's like, it's meant more to describe, um, you know, a way of doing things. So it's just interesting seeing how these terms get co-opted. I mean, it, his term got co-opted by Ralph Kimball, actually, who wrote the uh, Data Warehouse Toolkit in uh, 1996. And that book basically took the idea of a data mart uh, in Bill's book and then said that that was a data warehouse, actually. And hence the, uh, you know, kind of the East Coast, West Coast rivalry of uh, Bill and uh, Ralph for, for decades. Um, you know, but that, that stuff happens, right? You, you can see it happening with data mesh, actually, right now, where I think, you know, um, I, I know that I know Jamak is... Um, sometimes not pleased with how her term of data mesh has been co-opted by, uh, you know, certain technology vendors. And, but that's how the cookie crumbles. It, it is what it is, you know, um, uh, these things kind of a way of taking on a life of their own. And I, I think a lot of it is because people either don't read the, the original texts and definitions of stuff, or they just don't care. So, <laughs> <laughs> so. I read the, the data mesh section several times to finally get it, what it means. Like you said, it's microservice managed by different domains and different teams, right? So it's like a decentralized way of doing data engineering. Bingo. So does it mean at the organization level, the data engineering team should be decentralized? Under her um, approach, yes, it would. I mean, she calls it a, a socio-technical phenomenon, which I do agree with, right? So it's 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 a lot organizational, um, and so. And then some, some people say, and I think she also says this too, like maybe data engineers don't exist with data mesh, right? I actually have a hard time, um, uh, I think, agreeing with that point, um, precisely because, you know, it just means data engineers are distributed from, for different uh, product domains, right? But it's, it doesn't mean that they go away. It um, just means that they work for different teams, so. But, but but I think uh, her concept uh, and the way she relates that with, with DDD is good. Like, I feel like these days we're, we're kind of pulling information from search systems, uh, like against the will of the, the developers of, of those systems and, and yes. that no cooperation at, at all, you know, and when she put that concept of DDD and a data product. And I mean, because the work of data engineering will provide value to, to, to the system. So it, it doesn't make sense the, the way we do things today, uh, if you okay. think about it, you know? So I agree with you guys. I think it's going to happen. I don't know when, but yeah, it's going to happen. I think so. We're gonna say Matt? Oh yeah, and I, I mean, it, basically, I think anyone who's worked as a data engineer with the, the current standard structure of centralization, just as you were saying, it is kind of this weird fight between developers and data engineers. And so essentially this is almost like a hack, right? Like, well, just make it their data and then they're responsible for it. And then you don't have these communication issues and you don't have these walls between teams. Yeah, but that, yeah, it's hard. But I think it also depends on the company too and the organization. So like, you know, in the book, we, I think we talked about Conway's law. I think we do, I can't remember. Um, 
but that, that describes basically, you know, um, you'll, you'll build systems of communication around the way that your organization is structured and communicates. And that's, it should seem fairly obvious, but what this means for, for teams is, you know, if you're very centralized and very siloed, say, you know, departments and, and so forth, but something like data mesh probably isn't going to work at all, actually. Um, and you probably shouldn't try, right? It's just, you're not, you're not built for it. It's, it's, um, it is what it is. So. So you need to do that honest assessment of like, you know, how your company is, is structured as well. And, um, you know, if, if you can change things and great, and if you can't, then, then I guess you can't. So I'm, I'm reading a, a really good book right now um, called Agile, actually, which is not about software methodologies, but it's about how um, companies are actually adopting Agile methodologies um, to um, actually restructure how they do things. Um, so, you know, these could be tech companies. It could not be, they might not be tech companies, but they're you know embracing the Agile methodology um, you know, to help run faster. But the thing is, is like, you have to be sort of, uh, wired to do this. It's not like you can just shoehorn in agile or any other sort of framework into your company. If you're not, you know, ready for it, it's, um, uh, how many, how many people have like tried to, you know, do something that, you know, uh, I guess life changing or setting a goal or something like that, right. Where you're like, I'm going to, you know, cut weight or I'm going to, um, I'm going to eat better or, or that kind of thing. Right. I mean, it's, this is what a lot of change management's like. And it's like, these are lofty goals and I think they're good intentions, but at the end of the day, like it requires discipline and um, willpower and, and just sticking with it. And a lot of companies just don't do that. Like, like a lot of people don't achieve their goals for the same reason. It's just hard. It's easier to do what you've always done. So. Yeah. I mean, it's like the DevOps thing, right? What I've seen it again and again, again and again, is that the whole point of DevOps was to kind of merge the development teams and the ops teams and a lot of companies instead took the DevOps term and just slapped it under their ops team and kept the devs separate. It's like, well, it's not really DevOps in that case. And this can totally happen with data mesh if you're not fully 100% committed because it is a massive organizational change across all parts of tech in your company. Yep. There are all those new trends coming, like data mesh. Um, we're going from batching to streaming. We're going to the cloud. I feel like a lot of companies are not there yet yep. or not even on the way there. So what's your advice for companies? Should they go towards that direction and how should they get there? Hmm. I don't think question. every company needs to be a data company. And I don't think every company yeah. needs to be a tech company. I, I think, you know, there's, there's this, there's this idea, you know, that if you're not a tech company, you're going to get eaten by the ones that, you know, or, tech companies and so forth but i would say it really comes down to i think being a well-run company um and then you know that that accounts for more than anything i would say you know technology is technology it's it's inert um it's how you utilize it and, and leverage it in your company i think is what matters at the end of the day but um yeah i don't know i mean i, I think it, you know, if you have a good organization it can certainly benefit you if you have a crappy organization no amount of technology is going to help you uh, it's just it's kind of the, the sad truth of it and more just the reality. <laughs> so um, yeah. I don't know. What do you think about? Um, I, I would say about the cloud part specifically, and we can follow up on some of the other things too. Um, I think most companies are going to end up in the cloud, like moving their data warehouses, their existing data stacks to the cloud at some point. But kind of like Joe said, I think for some companies, if they recognize like, hey, we're not ready for really radical changes, it actually makes more sense for them to focus on just doing a really good lift and shift with maybe some slight evolution without trying to rip out their entire data stack and start over. Because well, even the basics like data modeling are really hard. As it turns well, for sure, out. yeah. And I think some of the best data teams I've ever seen, you know, they were using nothing more than Excel. But and by best, I mean, they had more, the most output, right? Like they added a lot of value to the business and were able to, you know, generate things like money and, you know, profit and weird, weird, weird concepts in some circles, I'm sure. But, um, you know, I mean, but, you know, so I'd rather have a team of people, I think that understand the, the business and know how to drive it with, with data versus people that want to use data um, for the sake of it. Right. But all too often, I think that's sort of the case. Cause it, again, as there's a lot of, um, you know, FOMO, fear of missing out, like if you're not doing this, then, then you're going to miss out. But and if you think about it from a, a how, how many people are familiar with the prisoner's dilemma, um, game theory. So basically the whole notion is of like, you have two, two people who get arrested. Um, you know, that you're, uh, um, do you, do you rat on the person and the other person, or do you, do you stay quiet? If you, if you both stay quiet, 
you know, you, you might get a, um, a harsher penalty, right? But you might get some, you might get time off uh, for good behavior if you rat out your friend. And so that what happens is, uh, you know, in prisoner's dilemma, the optimum situation is you both rat each other out, right? Um, but if you, if you follow this, you know, if you start applying that same game theory to, to other things like, uh, you know, whether or not you should do data um, because your competitors are, of course you should. Um, you know, the, the, the rational choice would be to, to embark on data initiatives and do them. And, and that same with the cloud and same with everything else. And so, um, you know, there's definitely, I think that it, it drives a lot of things. And so there's, you know, there's a lot of incentives from boards, corporate boards and so forth to, you know, digitally transform and modernize and all this other stuff. Right. But at the end of the day, I, what we often see is, you know, the, these intentions are good. Um, they're not really steered towards any particular goal. It's more like, oh, we have to do AI or, or machine learning or something. But it's like, well, what are you going to do with that? Um, we don't know. We just have to do it. And so that, that tends to be sort of the, uh, what we see quite often. Um, you know, I, I mean, we talk to CIOs and CTOs all the time. And, and I'm not kidding when I say like, we sometimes make diagrams for, for these people just so they can show them off to their other CTO friends. Uh, and show them what, what cool stuff they're working on, even if it's just a diagram, whether or not it's actually being done or not. This is sort of the other thing that goes on. So it's like, uh, it was a diagram driven development. Um, uh, there's also resume driven development. Um, so it, this happens often, but I would say, you know, back to your original question um, or, or point, it was like, there are, you know, there are some companies moving to the cloud for sure. Um, you know, but I think it, Hopefully people take, take a very sober approach to this stuff. I don't think the cloud is for everybody either, to be frank. Like, you know, um, sometimes you might be better off just, again, doing things pretty simple um, on-prem, so. Yeah, cloud can be costly. Like when Certainly I read can. the FinOps section, I was like, that makes a lot of sense. When I do inquiries, I know like if I query one terabyte of data, it's five bucks. But then other than that, I don't really know how much I spend as a user, mm -hmm. right? I write queries every day. So how, what's your recommendation for like users to optimize their queries or like their data operations? Um, this is a tricky problem. So um, I, I, I assume some of you have been following the whole like modern data stack debate on like Twitter and LinkedIn and such. And I think um, one of the points that that I've been making with other people in the argument is that the modern data stack itself actually isn't the problem. So in other words, things like Snowflake and BigQuery, that's not the problem here. The problem is that all of these tools are so easy to use now that you have people kind of doing data engineering things who have no idea what they're doing. And I, I feel like maybe at the user level, you actually need some actual leadership that sits above the users that can communicate with them and track expenses, right? Do these just basic operational things and say, hey, you spent um, 500 bucks in the last hour. Was there a reason for that? Like, can we figure out what's going on here? Like just basic operational monitoring is a good start. And if you don't have any data engineering or any op data ops at all, then, then this can be a big problem. Um, beyond that, I'm not not sure what the solution is, but it's something that like we need to keep thinking about. I don't know, Joe. What are your thoughts? Um, it is a tricky one, and <laughs> it's one that unfortunately you have to pay money to find out the answer. So, um, yeah, it's. Uh, I guess you know the thing is learn how your query engine works. I think that's that's a big thing, right? So understand your tools. So Snowflake, for example, it works differently than um, BigQuery, right? It, even though they're both um, serverless and sort of uh, pay as you go. I mean, the, the queries or um, it is different how you would uh, manage these things, right? Um, and, and BigQuery, you can use partitioning and clustering and, and really in, in um, Snowflake, you can have you know, the notion of clustering on large tables and you have different data warehouses or um, sizes and uh, multi-clusters. But these are the, the knobs you can turn, right? But at the end of the day, it still isn't. Computation is one of these things where I think... Um, people sort of go overboard with that at the expense of writing better queries and more efficient queries. So, you know, if you can avoid doing like full table scans, for example, in your query, then maybe you should do that. Uh, maybe query the data that you need. You don't necessarily need to do like a select star for everything and run up your credits because it's going to get all your data. And, you know, and especially in a big query, at least you, you kind of know um, upfront what you know, they tell you how much you're going to be charged, but for other uh, systems, no, you're going to find that out. DuckDB is one I'm very interested in. I might spend actually the weekend dorking around with that because I feel like that holds a lot of promise for um, local um, analytical queries. And our friend Jordan Tagani, um, who actually was a co-creator of BigQuery, like he's 
uh, we got a new company called Mother Duck that's um, you know focused on a um, in, in browser databases, I believe, right? So with DuckDB, and I think that actually might hold some um, some promise, you know, for for different types of queries. And because his whole notion is, why do you why do you need to send data back and forth over the wire every single time you make a query? It's kind of weird. You know, why don't, why don't you just uh, you know, why don't you just run it like you fig figure out the amount of like uh, latent comp uh, compute that you have on your uh, you know, your laptop or your phone, for example, right? That's, that's a lot of power. It sort of sits there, especially with these, you know, the Macs and the new like M series chips. It's insane, like how much power that thing has. So, and most companies and most people aren't querying that much data. And if you're having to do like petabyte scale queries every single time, like you're probably doing it wrong, actually. Like, why are you doing that? So, um, you know, so I think when he was when he was a PM at BigQuery, he looked at the usage and said that most people aren't querying that much data. So, like, why why do we focus all our efforts on big data stuff when most people have small data problems? So I think it was a pretty interesting revelation that, you know, one of the people who was, I think was responsible for the big data movement is now focused on small data, um, but that should tell you something, right? So, but in terms of optimizing queries, again, I would say just, you know, back to that question, know how to write good SQL and know your query engine, two things I would say, so. This, this painting is a, a complex topic. First time I heard about FinOps was uh, in your book, and then I, I bought the Riley book uh, about right. FinOps. Yeah. And it's kind of like this whole process. I mean, right. company level, like uh, finance together. And and I read only like 30% mm -hmm. and a lot of things make, make sense. I mean, the developers, they will not remember how much they are uh, spending uh, with their queries, but also you have like a team, a process, and then you say to the team, okay, we are uh, spending a lot. Uh, I've allocated all the costs, you, you spend all that. The, the, the team itself uh, will find a way to, to optimize the cost. It's, it's just that uh, developers don't think about those things like daily. They just want to get the job done. They, they don't care about how much they're spending. I don't know, that, that's my, my two cents. It's still a really hard problem for a couple of reasons. So first of all, I don't think companies have yet adopted the mentality. Like we, when you're looking at latency for your website, right? You have all this monitoring, you have full systems dedicated to monitoring like the Elk stack or something, just latency on your website. And then people are looking at those metrics continuously. What's my latency at any given time? What we really need to get to the point where we're kind of doing the same thing with costs, right? Like looking at them in near real time or maybe some kind of delayed real time and then saying, oh, I have a hotspot over here. I have a spike. Like what's going on? Uh, the, the other part, so you have an organizational change that's needed. And then also the cloud providers themselves don't make this particularly transparent. I mean, the tools are still very much lacking. Like you have to work really hard to see the costs in real time and to drill down into different areas. And so there's sort of this battle between even a, a FinOps team, a dedicated FinOps team and the cloud to get the data they need. Like you're gonna have to do your own work to filter out what you're looking for in that signal. For sure, there's other things, a huge opportunity in um, yeah. FinOps and cost management tools for the cloud. Uh, you're gonna see, I think a lot of startups and a lot of funding in this area, especially now with a looming um, you know, economic downturn and, and such, yeah. it's like, um, I think a lot of, you're going to see a lot of VC money going into a uh, cost management startups. So you have to. It I mean, makes it's sense. It's so complex that you probably need like anomaly detection to. Mm -hmm. to yes. Find out. That's right. Yeah. 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 I mean, somebody, you know, in one of the Slack groups, I mean, somebody posted a, um, I think they, I don't know what they're doing. I think they're, uh, they're doing something with uh, Google cloud storage. Anyway, they ended up getting a surprise hundred thousand dollar US dollar bill um, uh, just in one month. Uh, Google thankfully gave me credit for that, but it was like, they're doing something, something went wrong. And then they're like, why is our bill a hundred thousand dollars more than it was? I think it's supposed to be $8,000 a month, not a hundred thousand. So I, I once personally got like a hundred dollar uh, bill for cloud storage because I, something I do all the time, right? It's super easy to dump data into cloud storage and then just delete it as part of an experiment or something. So I like dumped a big query table into cloud storage and deleted it. And I got this like hundred dollar charge and it turned out I had not used, I had used like a lower tier, like cold storage tier. And so there's a deletion penalty if you do that. So, yeah, it's very easy to get burned on these costs. Mm -hmm. I would say, you know, the, the thing you should do if you're in the cloud is I, I highly recommend getting a, um, like a certification in whatever cloud you're working in. Um, just because it, it, the clouds have a way that they want to be handled and you have your own opinion about how it should be handled. And these are not the same things. 
um, the cloud's opinion of how it should be handled will trump your opinion of how you think it should be done. And so I, I would highly recommend getting a cert in AWS or um, GCP or Azure or whatever you're working in, just so you understand, okay, so like what are, what, how does this thing want to be treated? Like, how do they think about costs? What are their best practices? Um, you know, and go from there. I think, you know, it's, it's a good investment. Plus they're very marketable on the street, but these certs actually have a lot of value in the marketplace. So I highly recommend doing that. Matt and I get to do our snowflake certs next, next week, actually, because we have to- It's, really it's going to be awesome. It's so much fun. <laughs> so yeah, cool. Well, thank you. Yeah. Um, I think we're running out of time. Anyone else have questions? Um, I don't have a, um, sorry, I'm, I'm late. I had uh, something before this, but just a comment or a compliment on the book. I was, as I was reading it, I was like, uh, I felt like I already knew it, even though I didn't, which is like, uh, you know, a testament to how well structured it was where like topics I'm like, yeah, I haven't known about it, but the logic, like I felt like it built up, built up nicely in a cumulative sense. So it was like, once I got into like newer topics, I felt like, oh, okay. Like, yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. That makes sense. Nothing like, no, um, which is, which is hard because usually when I'm reading articles and stuff like that, like I don't get that impression. So yeah, I just want to say, uh, cool. That's yeah, really good. That was, uh, yeah, great job. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. You're, uh, it's almost like uh, achieving a level of clairvoyance or something by, uh, <laughs> while reading. So that's pretty yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you. Looking forward, what are you most excited about and afraid of? Like, um, what, 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 oh, what things like are going to go wrong? War or something? Okay. Um, uh, just in the tech. <laughs> <laughs> data uh, engineering. In, in data engineering, uh, you know, what I'm really interested in is, um, I mean, there's a lot of, oh, sorry, <laughs> coffee. Um, there's a lot of conversations about data modeling right now, and I find that's a fascinating topic. I'm very interested in um, sort of what's next in data modeling. There hasn't really been a new um, paradigm in data modeling since I would say 2002 with data vault, 2000 or whatever. So that's still a long time, right? 20 years. I mean, there's some stuff like activity schema, which I think is promising, but I don't know that it um, accounts for other things like streaming is, you know, streaming machine learning, um, you know, source systems, maybe becoming you know, analytical systems even. Um, I think data modeling is due for an entire rethink right now. The old techniques, I think they're, they're old for a reason, but they're, they're well-worn. But the thing is like, these techniques arrived on the scene many years ago because of the limitations of OLTP systems, right? That's why you have data warehouses. Um, but do you need that anymore? You know, that's, that's my big question So I'm struggling with. What about you, Matt? What's, what are you uh, excited or frightened about? So one of us at, at Turner Data is going to be writing an article about this soon. Um, one thing that I see looming on the horizon that's really exciting, but also kind of terrifying for data engineers, and uh, I'll, I'll just put a quick interjection and say this is probably something that all the data scientists and machine learning engineers here are, are thinking about too, quite a bit actually, is that the the continuing emergence of growth of unstructured data is just going to completely swamp the entire profession and change everything in ways that we can't even predict yet. Because I was actually I was thinking about this in the context of just like creating YouTube videos. Uh, Sophia, I know you do this too, and other people do as well. And I'm like, I'm just looking at the sheer amount of content uploaded, and we've all heard about the video revolution, but then when you really look at it and realize how easy it is to create video content. And realize also working with YouTube, how poorly their algorithms and analysis actually work. So for example, when I create a video, I'm supposed to add all these hashtags and things. And I'm like, you know, their way of handling this data is really kind of dumb still. It's not very smart at all. So yeah. what happens when we start getting a lot smarter with unstructured data? Does that just like swamp everything that data engineers even care about right now? Like Joe and I tried to write a timeless book, but maybe maybe the world will change so much in five years. That it will well, and data modeling too needs to account for unstructured data. That's yes, like, it's sort of the, exactly. uh, the hidden piece there, right? And it doesn't yeah. right now. It's like the structure, if you think about a, um, you know, an image, it's, it's pixels and it's uh, RGB, yeah. right? But, um, you know, but the, the context and the business meaning of that, of that image or that video, yeah. um, you know, that, I think that's, that's, the, that's the next frontier. Um, I mean, I'm looking at my phone right now, you know, speaking of videos, like my, my kid 
he's um, nine years old and wants to be a YouTube influencer. So he takes my phone and makes uh, videos of himself playing video games all day. And my, my storage is about to run out of my phone because he just does this. <laughs> I go for hours. Um, I don't think he understands what's going on. So I thought, I, you know, do something. But that's, but that's the thing. Video is easy to produce, right? Unstructured data is easy to produce. Why is it that, you know, Bill Inman, the, the creator of the data warehouse, why is it that he's focused on unstructured data right now? Why is he working on text? Because most data is unstructured. You know, we we shoehorn ourselves into rows and columns because it's convenient. But the thing is, it's not, um, rows and columns don't necessarily represent the real world. The real world represents the real world. And so that, that's, I wholeheartedly agree with what Matt's saying. And, you know, it's, I think it's where it's going. So, and it's also the interesting thing is, like, we talked about this in the last chapter, but the intersection of machine learning, um, software engineering and, and data engineering and how these, you know, the live data stack and how everything's basically going to become like, I would say seamlessly integrated together. And so it kind of throw upends the whole idea of like the modern data stack, for example, which I think is um, not that modern. And, right. you know, and I think it's a, it's a step along the way, but I, I can't, you know, I've been in data long enough to know that this is not like the final step. Like there's, there's a lot more to go. Like you're at, you're at mile three of like, you know, hundred mile race or a thousand mile race or an endless race. Right. But we're just getting started. Like this is not where it ends. So. I recently attended a talk by uh, Instacart data scientist. They propose to treat everything uh, unstructured and just train a huge language model on the unstructured data. That was just like mind blowing because you're not vectorize your text. You just treat everything as your text. Crazy. So, <laughs> so I have comments about that too. And this is yeah. another article I'll be writing. So all these new language models like Dolly and GPT-3, they're really smart and they're simultaneously really, really not smart in very predictable ways. So for example, the way these models work is they use a limited context look back. So they'll look back like 25 words. So what that means is that they're basically like a human with integrated amnesia. So they can't remember what happened in the recent past. And anyone who's ever had the experience of like acquiring a new language realizes that a lot of our comprehension actually doesn't come from the words, it comes from context. And so that means these models right now are really not good at doing a lot of things that humans are very, very good at. Like all of us on this call who've been here for a while know, oh yeah, we talked about these things. We're also good at forgetting in the sense that we don't memorize every word that was said. We kind of know the topics and then we build a mental model. And right now our models can't do that. And if we figure that out, it's a huge revolution, which I think will enable exactly what you're saying, Sophia. But right now I kind of question like, how well is this going to work? I don't know, Joe and others, what are your thoughts on this? <laughs> I mean, I remember back in the day, who, who's seen that movie Rain Man? I remember, I'm just kind of dating myself here. So that was based upon a guy here in Salt Lake City where we lived named Kim Peek. So if you want to see a really fascinating person, uh, Google Kim Peek, uh, last name is spelled uh, P-E-K. So for some reason, Kim's uh, uh, hemispheres and his brain were fused together when he was born. So he's functionally retarded. Um, like he's he's adult, like he, he can barely remember, or you know, he can barely like function in society, he just talks to himself and, and whatever. But the thing is, he also had, I think the best memory of any human being on the, on the planet, right? Like you, you give him a date and you tell you everything that happened on that date, probably everything. Like he would, um, I, would, I would actually sit across from him at the library and just watch him read phone books for hours and he would memorize everybody's name and address. That's what he did, right? But this reminds me a lot of like the, the models that, that we're building now, where it's like, the, you know, Kim Peek is like an example of, you know, of one of a kind human, but, um, and he had a very interesting skill set, but it didn't translate into anything that was productive for him in the real world, right? Like he still had to be chauffeured around by his dad and, he, you know, he was just disabled. Um, but the thing is, he, he also had this weird thing where he can memorize every single thing in the world and like with like 99% recall, it was crazy. Um, and so that, I think it's, you know, things like this, you know, do happen, but, you know, I, I saw, you know, last time I saw him was in 2009, I think he passed away shortly after, but, you know, but seeing that was like, I think mind blowing too. Cause I'm like, okay, could a computer ever do this? Like, I guess that's Google. Right. But he had, he had a weird way of understanding context too, that Google doesn't. So, you know, it, you know, so it was, it was fascinating to, to see, but it was also, I found it fascinating just because it, you knew that this guy, he was. He just couldn't function in society yet. He had this remarkable mind. So what does that mean for models? I don't know, but it's like, they're probably suited for certain applications, but could they generalize to, you know, the, the everything it, it's, it's hard to say. Why is it that our brains use, you know, like a, a few Watts of power, um, but they're, they're capable of so much yet. We have to train these uh, large models on, 
you know, uh, a lot, you know, a lot of computers and, and stuff and using a lot of power. Like why, well, what's the difference there? And that's, that's fascinating. So. There's a great book about that from uh, Jeff Hawkins. It's called a thousand brains. He's a neuroscientist and uh, he tries to create models based on, on neurosciences. It's very nice. That's cool. We'll get that right now. Thanks. Yeah. It's from Nomenta. Nice. Awesome. Um, thank you so much, Joe and Matt. We yeah, really course. appreciate you come talk to us today. Uh, any final words, advice for us? Uh, I mean, just keep doing what you're doing. I, I'm a big fan yeah. of your book club. I think it's, it's awesome. I might, might actually yeah. participate myself just to oh, thank uh, you. <laughs> yeah, make, be kind of fun. Um, uh, but yeah, I'd say, you know, just, just focus on continuous learning and, and that, that's going to get you really far in your career. That's the, in fact, it's probably the only thing that's going to get you far in your career is just continuously learning. So, so, you know, keep reading books like, you know, like the, the new one you're reading, I think it's, are you reading Chip's book now or is that, uh, which uh, book are you reading? No, we're reading, but uh, I already read Chip's books. I really okay. like, like her book. Um, She's cool. Yeah. 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 But you know, there's, there's a lot of good books. I would say, you know, meet people, you know, I think you're doing it right. The author series is, is good. Just, you know, have, talk to people. That's how you, um, how you grow your knowledge. So, um, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Of yeah. And kind of following up on what Joe said, I think it's a really exciting time to be in machine learning, data science, or data engineering. Just that, like like he was saying, you really have to stay on top of things, which is the entire point of this book club. Mm -hmm. yep. Yes, yes. Thank you so much. Of course, um, anytime. Okay, have a good day, everyone. All right, thank you. Take All care. Right, Thanks for the invitation. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye.